Right now, starting this morning, I'm going to do a three-week series called Critical Concerns. It's also Timely Topics. And today, I, I want to talk and focus on raising boys today. I don't mean to insult or leave out girls, but I think you will agree with me. There is a real challenge for boys today to become good men who are responsible and know who they are and love God and serve Him. In a day of gender fluidity, many guys are confused about what it means to be a man. And our culture does little to help. The result is a generation of young men who struggle to embrace their role and their responsibilities and purpose for which God created them. But what we need now more than ever is clarity on what it means to be a faithful man of God. Not an aggressive man of God. I'm not talking about that false idea at all. I'm talking about a faithful, good man of God. So let's look at that this morning. Girls today are taught there are no limits to who they can become, and that's a good thing. The sky is the limit, they're told. We even have a phrase for that. You go, girl, and rightly so. Girls are often encouraged, at least in Western society, to express themselves, to reach far and to fulfill their potential. And again, I think that's a good thing. Being the father, grandfather of two little girls, a five-year-old and a three-year-old, um, I'm excited to help them reach their potential. In fact, our five-year-old, Everly, ever since she was four, if you asked her, what do you want to be when you, when you grow up? She will say, I want to be a scientist. A si who, who does that? A scientist. Where'd that come from? But somewhere in her little psyche, her mind, she saw a scientist and what they do and said, that's what I want to be. And I hope if that's what God has for her and her desire is that direction, that's what she does. But there's a sense of empowerment, and rightly so, for girls today. But boys are often left confused about what it means to be a man. If we hear the phrase perpetual adolescence or perpetual childhood, we know instinctively what gender is being referred to. It's about, we're talking about young men, primarily 20s and 30-year-olds and even into their 40s, who are refusing to grow up and accept responsibility. These are men who are still acting like boys in many cases, playing video games throughout the day, abusing drugs and alcohol and underachieving. This brings us to the problem today. I want to share with you some statistics uh, in real time of what's happening with so many of our youth today, but especially boys. Men are falling behind women in college enrollment and graduation. I heard from someone that over 400,000 men in the United States have dropped out of college just this year alone. What is happening? Second, men are more likely to be unemployed as traditionally male-dominated dominated industries are disappearing. Men are more likely to be homeless. Men are more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. Boys are more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit, by a ratio of four to one over girls. Why is that? What's going on? Four to one. Males account for 7 out of 10 suicides. 7 out of 10. On average, there are 123 suicides per day right here in the United States. 123 most are male. Over 75% of all violent crime is committed by males. 75%. You say, well, that's because they got testosterone going through them. Well, that still doesn't explain it. And then we hear about the tragedies that just recently happened in Buffalo, New York, and in Uvalde, Texas. Senseless, crazy. Young men, 18 years of age, I believe both of them were, hooked on violent video games, feeling disgruntled, I think demonically possessed, going into public places in Uvalde, going into a school and shooting little kids. Who does that? We've got a serious problem. It's a mental illness problem. We've got a culture that is ultimately toxic for so many in raising healthy, normal, productive young people. And as a church, it should concern us. As a community, it must 
concern us. I think you would agree that there is a difference between being male and being a man. Maleness just happens. Manhood does not. It must be developed. Maleness is a biological event. You were born male. Of course, of course, some are challenging that today. What does it mean to be a male? But basically, biologically, you're born a male, if you are. But manhood is a process of character development. You become a man. So manhood must be taught. And if it isn't taught, then it fails to develop, and we see the dysfunction and the consequences. This leads us to the problem of perpetual male adolescence, where young men don't want to grow up, like the Peter Pan syndrome, never wanting to grow older. Here's a point, the point we need to realize as a church and a society. Manhood can really only be taught and developed by older men instructing and showing what is expected of the boy in order to become a part of the fraternity of good men. This is where we come in as parents, as fathers especially, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and a community of concerned people, both men and women, who want to help boys reach their full potential as a man. The verse I'm going to camp on this morning is 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It's a short verse. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he makes a statement. He makes, actually makes several statements, but one I want to focus on. He writes in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on the alert. Why? Because spiritual warfare is going on. Satan wants to defeat you, discourage you. Be on the alert. Stand firm in your faith and act like men. Notice that. Be strong. But Paul says, act like men. In Paul's day, there was a general understanding of what it meant to act like a man. Today, we have largely lost that understanding. And it has led to gender confusion, both in boys and girls. We are becoming a society that wants girls to be like boys and boys to be like girls. No wonder there's such gender confusion today. So here's the problem. Let me kind of just spell it out. If manhood in its biblical understanding is not taught to boys, then these boys, as they mature, will gravitate into one or the other extreme. One extreme they will gravitate toward is they will move toward lethargy and passivity. These are guys who lack get up and go and determination, and ambition. They're just drifting through life. They want to drift. Or they'll go to the other extreme, and the other extreme is they will move toward aggression and exploitation. This is the classic alpha male, the predator who is often guilty of sexual aggression against women, and violence, as we see in so much gang activity in many of the cities across America. Both of these extreme, extreme passivity, lack of challenge, and extreme aggression and violent tendencies, both these extremes are unhealthy and wrong and dangerous for us as a society. So boys need to be taught and shown what it means to be a man in the proper sense, the biblical sense of that word. Margaret Mead, the famed anthropologist, wrote a book entitled Male and Female back in 1968. In this landmark book on manhood as it relates to society, she made this observation. I hope the quote is coming up. In every known human society, everywhere in the world, everywhere, so it's a universal truth, the young male learns that when he grows up, one of the things he must do in order to be a full member of society is to provide food and protection for some female and her young. Every known human society rests firmly on the learned, nurturing behavior of men. Notice she says that this nurturing behavior must be learned. 
Dr. Mead then explains why this behavior must be intentionally done generation after generation to each new generation of boys. She writes, this behavior of being learned is fragile and can disappear rather easily under social conditions that no longer teach it effectively. Social responsibility on the part of the male can disappear, she says, rather quickly if, if we don't teach it effectively. So the building of men is arguably the first responsibility of a healthy family, community, and society. Right now in the African-American community in America, 70% of all children that are born are born without a dad in the home. 70%. They're lacking that fatherly influence in raising boys in their community. No wonder there's such a widespread use of violence, drugs, gang behavior. It's a breakdown. We need to be mentoring these young boys as they become men so they know what it means to be a man. But let's look at it. What does it mean to be a good man from the Bible standpoint, from a biblical point of view? What does it mean to act like a man when Paul says, act like a man, man up? What does he mean? Well, let's look at that. I want to share with you 10 qualities of manhood. If you have a pencil or pen, you might want to write these down and reflect on them, think about them, share them with someone you know who's raising a boy today. 10 qualities of manhood. Now, what are these qualities of healthy manhood? To be genuine, these qualities must apply to men in every culture and not just our own here in the U.S. They must be qualities that reflect what God has put in men that make us more like Him, that reflect His image, and not just some contrivance that is politically correct for a particular culture at a particular time. It has to be universal. And the thing I want to point out, when you think about what is a manly man, there's no one stereotype, especially when it comes to being a good man. Good men can differ in their temperament, their talents, their interests, their physical abilities, For instance, Teddy Roosevelt was a very robust man, very active, but he was a different kind of good man than Abraham Lincoln, who was more cerebral, more reflective. Both were good men. Or Mr. Rogers, remember Mr. Rogers' neighborhood? He was no Chuck Norris, but they are both good examples of what it means to be a good man. So you can't just stereotype what it looks like, macho man. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a good man from God's perspective. So let's look at it. What are the qualities that we would expect that would reflect God best in men? Well, the first one is to good men are courageous. It's interesting in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, that after the Apostle Paul says, act like men, the very next statement is, be strong. Be strong. And he's not talking about just physical strength, not that at all. He's talking about strength of heart. Courage. Be strong. It means to do what is right regardless. Courage means a man does not think back or shrink back from a necessary challenge, regardless of the risk. He will face danger, difficulty, and self-denial for the sake of others. That is true bravery and manhood at its best. Courageous. In our church, we have had a slogan that's through COVID has said, choose faith over fear. We don't give in to our fears. We're sunk if we give in to our fears. We need to be wise, need to be informed, but we choose faith over fear. Well, a good man chooses courage. Just as fear is uh, contagious, so too is courage. Courage is contagious. We need more men who set that kind of example. Second, what does it mean to be a good man? It means that a man steps up. He's active. He's involved, not passive. A man should be the first one out of his seat, both figuratively and literally, when a need arises. He's a problem solver, and he takes initiative. Passivity is never manly, being a wimpy male. 
My first girlfriend, when I was in seventh grade, turned her heart toward me because when we were in this assembly in a large room, there weren't enough chairs for all the students. She had to stand. I saw her standing there, and so I gave up my seat and let her sit there. She was so impressed, she decided to go out with me. Now, what does that mean in seventh grade? Well, it means we got to hold hands. It didn't last long. I guess there was something else she saw in me that she didn't like. But anyway, she saw that I was thoughtful. Men, thoughtfulness is sexy. It is attractive to be thoughtful and considerate. So he steps up. He doesn't sit back and wait for others to do it and deal with it. He steps up. Third, a good man provides and protects. This is what Margaret Mead the famed psychiatrist was saying, protects and, pro- and provides. A true man will do what he has to do, even sacrifice, in order to take care of his family. He will even put up with a bad job if that bad job is the only job and the only way he has to provide for his family. Day after day, he will go on that job if that means he can bring food to his family. He will do what is necessary to take care of his family. A true man accepts responsibilities. Real men don't abandon their families. We're seeing too much of that today. And then fourth, what is a good man? A good man has integrity. A man's bond should be his word. All you need is a handshake from a good man, and that's it. That seals the deal. Deal done. A man keeps his word and is dependable. And a good man doesn't cheat on his wife. He is loyal. He is honest. He is faithful. So he has integrity of soul. And then fifth, a good man has tenacity. I like that. Tenacity. The old word is stick to They're determined. They don't just quit the slightest little trouble. No, they stay at something. They don't shrink away from a challenge. A good man works hard to overcome obstacles. He doesn't quit at the first sign of trouble. He stays at it. If there's difficulties in the marriage, he does what he can to improve it, to work on it, to get counseling. Do what you have to do, but he stays at it. He doesn't run. Tenacity. We need more of that strength of soul today. Six, a good man has self-control. A true man keeps his anger under control. And I Believe me, I fight with this every day. I I can't watch the news without anger flaring up. I can't drive down the street with all the, uh, maybe some of you are here, slow drivers and without getting upset. (laughs) Am I right? I mean, it's just traffic will bring it out in you. But a good man keeps his anger under control. He is not easily provoked to anger. I want to give you a verse. Proverbs 16, verse 32. Proverbs 16, 32 says, He who is slow to anger, keeps his anger under control, is better than a mighty warrior. You can have all the strength and training in the world as a warrior, but you're not as strong as a person who can keep his anger under control. And it says, He who rules his spirit has his anger under control than he who captures a city. So it's a wonderful strength to have. Yes, things will upset you. Yes, things will disappoint you. But to keep that anger, don't rage. Don't shout, especially at those in your home. A good man keeps his anger under control. He stays calm, even when provoked. And then seven, what is a good man? A good man accepts authority. He's willing to accept the authority of others over him whether that authority is God himself or a boss or his own father or a teacher in his life or a coach or a drill instructor if you're in the military or spiritually a pastor. A good man accepts that authority, thrives under that authority. Now, if that authority is wrong and corrupt, a good man will stand up to that authority. But he will also be willing to accept authority in his life. A true man is not a renegade who despises all authority. He's willing to submit to it.
to authority. And then eight, then what does it mean to be a good man? It means that you have loyalty. A man who is uh, following Christ is loyal to his friends and family. He doesn't abandon them or betray them. If a friend needs something, a good man will literally take his shirt off his back if that's going to help you. He's going to do what is needed to help you. That's loyalty. He stands with you through thick and thin. He doesn't walk away from you. We need more people of loyalty like that. And then ninth, what does it mean to be a good man? It means to have humility. Humility of soul. A man who is secure in himself doesn't need to brag or praise himself. He doesn't need to draw attention to himself. Look what I've done. No, a good man focuses on others, not himself. He isn't afraid to give praise and thanks to others when that praise and thanks is due. He's willing to put others first. We need more humility. It's rare in today's professional sports that you see a humble winner. There are some, and it's wonderful when you see it. And I love it when an athlete, when they win, give praise to God and, and thank Jesus in their lives. But a humble winner is difficult. Make sure you're one of those. God blesses you. If He's given you more than what others have materially, be a humble person. Don't say, look at me and how I'm entitled. Humility is a mark of godliness. God loves humble people. He favors the humble. He opposes the proud, the Bible tells us. And then number 10, the last quality is compassion. A man of God has compassion. True manhood has a tender side to it. I love the idea of a big old burly man holding this tender little child in his arms. It's a beautiful picture of strength and tenderness. Compassion sees the hurt that others are going through and wants to help. There's a compassion to them. As men, solving problems is what we do. And if there's a problem someone has had, we may not be able to solve all the problems, but we do what we can to help. We get involved. That's compassion. Well, folks, these are the qualities, the characteristics of a good man. When Paul says, act like a man or man up, this is what is being referred to. This is what is being described. And if these qualities are not taught, then we as a family and as a church and as a community and as a nation, we suffer. We have men run amok. We have men who have gone basically berserk. We have too much of that today. So we need to demonstrate these qualities. We need to pass them on to the next generation of emerging men. When we don't, that only is going to lead to trouble, both in the home and the community and our nation. How many remember the organization Big Brother? Can I see some hands if you remember that? It was a few years ago, Big Brother. And it was an idea. They knew that if you didn't have a strong father figure in your home, you needed a mentor, a man mentoring another man, a younger man, and helping them to develop these very character qualities that we are looking at today. That's what Paul was to his son in the faith. It wasn't his literal son, but his spiritual son, Timothy. Timothy was Paul's protege. His, Paul mentored him. And in 1 Timothy 6.11, Paul writes, But flee from these things. And what things? Greed and materialism and a selfishness. You man of God, he's addressing Timothy personally, he says, you flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. Again, it's manly to be gentle and tender. That's what we should be focusing on becoming as men of God, those of you who are men here today. Men of outstanding character. When I think of that, I think of Ben Carson. How many of you remember Ben Carson? Uh, a remarkable man. He came from inner city poverty. His family didn't have much. But one of the things his parents taught, he and his brother, was you get a good education, you work hard, and you don't see yourself just as a helpless victim. Do what you can. Work hard at it. 
And of course, he did. And he went on to be the number one student in his high school and I believe his college graduating class. He went on to med school. He became a brain surgeon. One of the most sought after in his field. He also was a presidential candidate in 2016. A man I think most of us here greatly admired just for his character, his soft-spoken honesty and integrity. He then went on to serve in the Trump administration as Secretary of HUD, HUD, or Human and Urban Development. Carson said in this book that I just read called Created Equal, Carson said, if you believe you're a victim, you will stay a victim. If you feel that there's no hope, you will act defeated. And he says, what we need is to have a can-do attitude, not a defeatist attitude. Remember, he came from inner city poverty. He overcame because he had that can-do spirit. This is what we need to pass on to the younger generation, whether men or girls, boys or girls, men or women, both genders, a can-do spirit. Carson said the key to success is hard work, vision, see what you, can, what you want to do, and determination to reach it. Hard work, vision, and determination. He has two sons. They have both followed in his shoe steps. He has been a good mentor to both. In our time remaining, let me just share with you a few final observations, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. Women, of course, can have these same ten qualities I've listed, but they do them in a different way and for different reasons. But they also can have these same wonderful qualities character qualities. We've just been focusing on developing boys into being good men. A man, second, must live out these character qualities daily and display them conspicuously in the community. We need more men who are good men who are displaying these qualities. Third, no man possesses all of these qualities in full measure. In other words, no one is perfect, but he should continually strive to improve. No matter what your age, always striving to improve. Fourth, if a young man hasn't been taught these qualities, then he must be mentored by men who have. And that's where a church family comes in, where we are to be like fathers and grandfathers to the young children and young boys and girls in our midst. We need to be mentoring as any way we can, teachers and coaches, youth group leaders, We need to have that kind of an influence. And then finally, Jesus is our role model when it comes to being a good man. Jesus is the perfect man. All these ten qualities I've listed are perfectly uh, seen in him. He was strong and courageous. He took initiative in helping the weak. He provided for others. He served. He was humble. He cared for the hurting. He demonstrated integrity in everything he did. He modeled patience. Of course he did, having to live with those 12 lunkheads, his disciples, for three and a half years. It perfect that trait in anybody. But he modeled patience, and he kept his anger under control. When he did act out and overturned the tables there in the temple, it was a righteous anger. Not about him getting ticked off, but demonstrating a, a just anger for God's holiness and righteousness. And finally, Jesus gave himself completely, demonstrated that sacrificial spirit when he gave himself there on the cross for us, died there for us, bearing our sins on his body. Wow. Jesus is the perfect picture of the perfect man. So being a man is best learned by keeping your eyes on Jesus. We all, male and female, do well to keep our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is that role model we need to follow. As parents and grandparents, I want to just encourage us all here to be good role models. We need more good role models in our society for both our boys and our girls. There's a lot of confused girls today and wondering what does it mean to be a a girl? We need to model for them. Where these kids, boys and girls, are growing up in so many ways in a messed up society, There are many who don't even want to use pronouns of he and she and 
her and him. It's going to be a lot of confusion out there, and that's where we can come in and helping them and encourage them. So let's pray for our kids who are subject to so much social engineering and re-engineering today by a culture that has largely rejected God. And being that this is Father's Day, I want to just address all of you men here today. Be a good example. You have no idea the influence you can have, even late in life, on those who are younger than you. We have a couple of uh, older coaches here in our church who have had a great influence in mentoring me. Uh, I don't know if they're here, Earl Stanford and Jim Talley, both in their mid-80s. Both of these men were coaches earlier in their life. And what is interesting, in both of their lives, the people they coached, the young men they coached, decades later, came back and said to each of them, you have no idea the difference you made in my life. You had a real influence in my life. Think about the coaches and teachers in your life and the difference they've made. So never underestimate the influence, the impact you can have, both as men and women, on the next generation. We need more good role models today. Role models that love Jesus and serve Him and act like Him. Well, because this is Father's Day, what I would like to do is have all the men, all the dads, all the dads, fathers, grandfathers, would you just stand? I want to pray for you. Just stand. Go ahead. Let's give a hand for all these men. Stay standing. I want to pray for you. God bless you. Thank you for being the role model that you are for having the influence you have. Never underestimate the power of your example, your influence in the lives of others who are younger than you. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for this time in your word that we can look at what does it mean to act like a man. It doesn't mean being macho or an aggressive or a bully. It means the opposite. It means being thoughtful and tender, polite, but also courageous and strong. I pray for each of these men that they would experience your blessing, not just this day on Father's Day, but throughout this week and throughout this year and throughout their lives, that you would encourage them and strengthen them, help them to realize the impact that they have, no matter how old they may be, that they can still have on their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. God, we just ask your blessing on them now. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.